Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine and I'm back to talk about the COVID vaccine a few days earlier than expected. This video will necessarily be US centric since I'll be talking about the Pfizer BioNTech COVID vaccine that's about to be discussed by the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee of the FDA. They're scheduled to have a meeting tomorrow to decide whether to grant an emergency use authorization for the vaccine and uh, in preparation, they released a 53-page briefing document two days ahead of time, the highlight of which is the phase three trial data. This data is what everyone's been asking for, and I've mentioned it on this, pro on this channel before that I've been asking for it, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Specifically, is this COVID vaccine safe and is it effective? Before that though, I need to spend a minute on a big disclaimer of sorts because I know that many people have concerns about the COVID vaccine candidates in general. There are uh, concerns that the products were rushed, um, that the time frame was really fast, that the long-term safety data is not available yet. Um, some people have concerns that these pharmaceutical companies stand to make a lot of money. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's true, but I, I understand the concerns about it. Um, and that for various reasons, doctors and public health experts may not be honest, that there are conflicts of interest that can make them not objective. I know that people are worried, I get it. So before discussing the trial, I want to convince you that I can be trusted on this. I have never had a financial relationship with a pharmaceutical company. I sit on no boards. At the end of my intern year, I was given a one-time made up no free lunch award for being the least likely member of the class to have pharmaceutical relationships to disclose in future publications. I was given this because I refused to accept as much as a pen or a cookie from a farm rep. And this was at a time when their presence on the wards was ubiquitous and they were responsible for providing nearly 100% of the daily, otherwise free lunches for interns and residents. Medical device companies have offered to sponsor my videos here on this channel. That is pay me money for a quick 20 second plug of their product. And I have always declined. I have no paid promotions or sponsored ads. If you've seen my prior COVID videos this year on the vaccine, on remdesivir, or on convalescent plasma, you may remember that I always approach these interventions with skepticism. Overall, I think the medical establishment errs on the side of excessive optimism when discussing and announcing new treatments. Even just two weeks ago, in my last video on the COVID vaccine, after press releases announced that multiple vaccines had 95% efficacy, I said, hey, that's great news, and, and I'm optimistic, but I was not prepared to endorse any specific vaccine or receive a vaccine myself until we had the data to examine. I say this all not as a humble brag, though I appreciate that's how it might come across, but rather I say this because I want you to understand and to believe that I am one of the least likely medical professionals on the internet to promote a treatment without sufficient scientific justification. And after reading through the FDA briefing document, the same one the committee will discuss for hours tomorrow, I am 100% convinced that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is as safe and as efficacious as the media reports have claimed. Everyone who is eligible to receive it should do so at their earliest opportunity. It lives up to its hype. Outstanding efficacy was seen across the age spectrum from teenagers to the elderly, with some degree of protection becoming evident within two weeks of the first dose, though two doses are required for maximum benefit. And the vast majority of side effects that were seen were mild and similar to what's seen with older vaccines using well-established technologies. I've been told that Stanford will have doses of the vaccine within a week, and I absolutely will get it on the first day it's made available to me. I wanted to get that punchline out of the way relatively early for viewers who are only interested in that, which is totally fine. But for now, for those who are interested in the details, I'm going to go through the actual trial data. Although the trial is not formally published yet, we can still review and critique it like we would any randomized controlled trial. We have all the data necessary for that process. And in fact, in some ways, this and Moderna's parallel vaccine trials, they're debatably the most important clinical trials in the history of medicine. 
This feels sort of like the medicine equivalent of critiquing Albert Einstein's 1905 paper that introduced the world to the theory of relativity on the day it was published, which is really kind of cool. So let's talk about the phase two, three trial of BNT162, more commonly known as the Pfizer vaccine. There are relevant links in the video description. We'll start with the methods. It was a double-blinded, randomized, controlled trial. Who were the study subjects enrolled in the trial? It began with enrolling adults aged 18 and above, but after the trial was started, there was no evidence of increased risk of adverse events in the youngest participants, so the enrollment criteria was widened to include people as young as 12. The most notable exclusion criteria included a previous diagnosis of symptomatic COVID, significant immunosuppression such as systemic steroids or chemotherapy, receipt of medications intended to prevent COVID, such as prophylactic hydroxychloroquine, which I do not recommend, and women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. While that last one is typical for a fir first phase three trial of a new therapy, it's going to end up being a problem since it might mean that the vaccine is not initially authorized to be used in pregnant women, including pregnant healthcare workers. We'll need to see how the FDA handles that problem. It's a whole nother discussion. Subjects were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive either a two-dose regimen of the vaccine separated by three weeks or two doses of placebo also separated by three weeks. The trial's primary endpoint was COVID incidence in which COVID was defined as the combination of a positive NAAT or PCR test within four days of having fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste or smell, myalgias, which is sort of like muscle and body aches, uh, sore throat, vomiting, or diarrhea. So the study is looking for the prevention of symptomatic disease, not necessarily asymptomatic infections. Secondary endpoints, that is endpoints that are still examined, but which were not the central focus of the study, and for which there may be too few events to detect a statistical difference between groups, included the incidence of severe COVID, which in this case was defined as hypoxemia, severe tachycardia or fast heart rate, shock, multi-organ dysfunction, admission to an ICU, or death. Now, on to the results. First, um, whenever you look at a study, the first, thing you should, the first results you should look at is a breakdown of the study participants to ensure that there was a diversity of age, sex, and race, and that those groups were equally divided between the vaccine and placebo arms. There were 43,651 participants, which is just shy of the trial's initial target of 44,000. There was an even distribution based on sex. The mean age in both groups was 50 years. They were 17% non-white, which is significantly less than the U.S. population generally, but this is still better than many trials, and in fact, probably better than most trials. Half had a medical comorbidity that places them at an increased risk of death from COVID. And now the most important figure. This shows the cumulative incidence of COVID between the two trial arms, starting from the moment that the first dose was administered. The red line is the placebo arm and the blue is the vaccine arm. The arms are indistinguishable up until a sharp point of divergence at 10 to 14 days after which there is a very low additional incidence of COVID in the vaccine arm. A less dramatic but nevertheless additional finding here is that there was no evidence of waning protection within the four-month follow-up period. So in other words, the antibodies that are triggered by the vaccine stick around at least for a little while, which was not something that was assured to happen. While one might hypothesize from the trial that a good enough level of protection maybe only requires one dose, there wasn't a one-dose arm of the trial, so that's only speculation. And investigators and scientists are still very strongly recommending receiving both doses. The overall efficacy of the vaccine in preventing COVID after two doses was calculated at 95%, as was reported by the media, and was similarly high in all ages. Regarding severe COVID, specifically, the number of cases observed so far among participants has been too small to conclusively state that the vaccine is protective, but it's trending in that direction. Additional data over the coming months will more definitively answer that question. 
So the vaccine is efficacious. Now, what about safety? In short, the majority of vaccine participants experienced a so-called solicited injection site reaction within seven days, which means that when they were specifically asked, they reported mild soreness, redness, or swelling at the injection site, which is typical of all vaccines. Other common side effects were fatigue, headache, muscle pain, and chills, all of which generally seemed more common after dose number two. Less than 1% of participants had what was considered to be a serious adverse event following ejection, but the rates were virtually the same between the vaccine and the placebo groups, meaning that only a tiny, tiny number were likely caused by the vaccine itself. And while six patients out of the nearly 44,000 died, four of them were in the placebo group and only two in the vaccine group. The two deaths in the vaccine group were attributed to a heart attack and arteriosclerosis, or uh, like hardening of the arteries, um, which are really not plausibly linked to a vaccine reaction. So that's it. That's a summary of what we've got. In short, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is even more successful than scientists and medical professionals had hoped for. I will be truly shocked if the FDA does not grant an emergency use authorization within 24 hours of the committee meeting tomorrow. Once again, I am, I'm very, very far from being a pharmaceutical industry shell. Like, but if, if this vaccine is made available to you, I would urge you to be vaccinated in the strongest possible terms. In the meantime, cases are still very rapidly climbing in most parts of the country. It will probably take another six months to achieve herd immunity through vaccines here, though that time frame will be sped up the more that people are willing to take the vaccine. For now, we still need to social distance and wear masks even after you start taking the vaccine series. We need to avoid public indoor spaces, particularly restaurants and bars. I honestly, I can't imagine eating in a restaurant right now. Like, I don't care if it's the French laundry. The food and service is not worth the risk. You know, you want to support local businesses. That's fantastic. I want to do that too. But order takeout. And, and really, really consider not traveling for Christmas. I know it sucks. We haven't, our, our own family hasn't seen any of our extended family in a year either. Getting through this pandemic was always going to be more of a marathon than a sprint. But we are well more than halfway through this by now. We all need to be patient and persevere through this winter. And if our country finally collectively gets its act together, we can all have giant family reunions at the beach next summer for postponed holiday dinners mask and fear free.